Welcome everyone to the third Crown Seminar of the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, I'm so pleased um, to welcome all of our um, attendees and particularly our wonderful panelists, um, Jonathan Wirtson and Rana Baker who will be in conversation with him. Um, just before I introduce um, our speakers basically, uh, just to give you a sense of how the next hour and 15 minutes are going to go, Jonathan is going to give a, is going to speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then he and Rana will be in conversation with each other at around 11.45, we'll um, take questions from all of you who are in attendance. Our chat is closed, so if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So with the housekeeping stuff put aside, um, it gives me great, great, great pleasure uh, to welcome Jonathan Wurtson to our campus today, to Brandeis. He is an associate professor of sociology and international affairs at Yale University, some university somewhere nearby, not sure. Um, his first book was called Making Morocco, Colonial Intervention and the Politics of Identity. And it was published in 2015 and it won the 2016 Social Science History Association President's Book Award. Um, his work focuses on society and politics in North Africa and the Middle East, particularly in regards to interactions catalyzed by the expansion of European empires in the region. We're gathered today because he has a new book that he has published, which is gonna be the topic of today's conversation. This new book, which I'm gonna hold up, it's called World Making in the Long Great War, How Local and Colonial Struggles Shape the Modern Middle East. And it was published by Columbia University Press a couple of months ago. Um, uh, the person who will be in conversation with um, Jonathan is our own uh, junior research fellow, Rana Bakker. She is a, um, she holds a PhD in Middle Eastern, South Asian and African studies from Columbia University. And she just defended a fantastic dissertation titled Engineering Profit, Egyptian Railways and the Unmaking of Prosperity. And before I hand um, the microphone basically to Jonathan, I thought it would be worth reading just a short couple of sentences from the preface of his book to give you a sense of how the topic that he has written about and which will be the subject of today's conversation, how expansive it is, not just in terms of the way in which it illuminates the past, but also the way in which it has implications for how we think about and talk about the Middle East today. So he writes, focusing less on peace settlement pen strokes and more on the realities of state formation and violent conflict, recognizing that it, World War I, was war that made borders in the region from Morocco to Iran rather than the reverse, forces a rethinking of modern Middle East's origins. My hope is that it also helps us reimagine the region's present and future. The greater Middle East has been passing through a similar critical transitional period in the early 21st century, during which political orders have been undone in revolution and civil war, new policies have been imagined, re have been imagined and political boundaries have become both more fluid and more rigid. And with that, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Nakame. Um, that's a great uh, way to get into this. Um, it is very much uh this is my first time at the crown center and it's just a real pleasure to be here i think uh marilyn and karen and those that just brought this uh helped this happen thank you rana for for joining me in this conversation and um i uh wanted to just start off so a lot of people in the audience i would presume have not been able to read the book so uh i'm gonna give a short overview and hopefully you know not go on too long uh, but just to kind of give you a sense before we move into a discussion um, bet between the two of us. So let me share my screen and, and this will be a quick tour here of uh, the book. And so effectively, the world making in the long great war is uh, basically 
addressed at this central question of how was a modern Middle East made, um, which is uh, one of those Genesis narratives that um, in, it, it, there's, I would say overall, there's not a lot of contestation on it. Um, there is a kind of standard narrative that either in stronger or harder or, or less uh, more, like softer, more nuanced ways that really shapes how we think about the making of, of the modern Middle East. And then I propose the alternative. I'm going to give you an overview of what I'm talking about by that. And then, you know, with, end with just kind of maybe, uh, going into the, the conversation with a few thoughts of what, what the present day relevance is. In some ways, basically what I'm asking is, how do you get from this map, which is uh, not exactly the way I'd want to represent it, but I'm trying to capture the idea that from west to east, you have an Alawite, an Ottoman, and a Safavid, Kam Qajar, uh, political order across the Atlantic to the Iranian plateau, three Muslim polities that by the mid 20th century uh, has been reworked into an interstate system that's been divided into these subunits. What am I arguing against? I'm going to, going to go very quickly. So it's like literally we're zooming over this in a helicopter. This is, those of you in the audience that are teaching the Middle East or you've studied it, this is the narrative we all kind of know and it's what I've used in my own um, teaching of this. Now I have to change because I've been thinking about this and, and thinking that we have to we have to revise this narrative. But effectively, Sykes-Picot narrative and here, I'm using the Sykes-Picot agreement as a shorthand for a bigger, just to capture uh, the bigger structure of this narrative. It's based on wartime and post-war agreements and treaties. And then you go through a litany of promises that are being made among imperial actors and local actors. Uh, those including the promises the British make in the Hussein McMahon correspondence um, to Sharif Hussein and the Hejaz. Agreements are being made between the British and the French, Marc Sykes, Georges Picot, but also Russian and then later Italian uh, promises that are made uh, in this map, which is the full map, of the Sykes because you see the zones that are blue and pink are the British and French zones of direct and indirect control. But it's important to remember the Russians are promised the Straits of Constantinople. They're promised the three Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire and Jerusalem in Palestine is going to be an international zone. Then, you know, this next promise, I'm just going through this, this is a recap. Uh, the British promise Palestine in some form uh, to, uh, in, a, in a letter of support from uh, Balfour to the World Zionist Movement that the British will support the creation of a Jewish national home after the war. And then at the Paris Peace Conference, these things come together and effectively the Treaty of Sev is the end point of this and the region's broken down into uh, the Russians are out of the war after the Russian Revolution. The Italians don't really figure into the story that much uh, the way it's usually told. Uh, but the British and the French are the main kind of characters that come out of this. Um, they subdivide Syria and Mesopotamia into Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq. And that is the kind of origin point of the rest of the story. But then like at the end of class, you kind of say, but wait a minute, uh, Turkey actually is an exception here. And uh, out of Turk and the Turkish revolution reworks that agreement. Um, and Lausanne in 1923, that's recognized. I'm not going to read this whole quote, but this is just the classic, I'm doing quickly who I'm arguing against. This is just the, the, the kind of classic summation of the, the, the narrative, which is really oriented towards the great powers. The local actors do not figure a great deal. Uh, it's the British that are inventing and fabricating, et cetera, in, in that story. So to quickly move off of that, or, or, or actually to, to wrap up, why does this work? I mean, this is one of the things that's hard about what I was trying to argue in the book is that this is a very intuitive, it's a legible, it's a clear, you can you can tell your students in five, you know, a, a kind of five point outline, what happened? How did the modern Middle East get made? It also has a normative kind of moral clarity that there's an original sin. The British and the French screwed up the region because they imposed these artificial and arbitrary boundaries that have since been, uh, that kind of set up the, the tensions in the region in the present day tensions included. What's wrong with it? Again, I'm going to go faster and we can spend more time to unpack some of this in the, in the Q&A. But effectively, it's historically incorrect to say that the story ends in 1920 or to even say it ends in the 19, in 1923. Because if you actually look at the realities on the ground, 
from the reef war that's uh, or the reef republic which is expanding and establishing establishing itself in the west and the reef mountains all the way across the board from what becomes libya to syria to eastern anatolia to the arabian peninsula over the zagros into uh the the turmoil that's happening in in iran in the 1920s this is a map that is not settled the peace uh settlement is not a, a settlement it's actually undone and you have uh, a lot of fluidity and dynamism that's happening in the map what is wrong with sykes picot it's presuming that those agreements and treaties actually create reality and the real the fact is that they didn't um facts on the ground were moving and and, and changing and, and actors were were creating reality on the ground um that it is something we have to capture. It also assumes that all of those things, the treaty terms in SEV or in Lausanne are actually real containers and boundaries. And the ways that we kind of snap from World War I to the, the mandate or interwar period, we sort of retrospectively, anachronistically encounter, you know, retropose these containers that are really should be thought of as outcomes rather than givens. And the other kind of implication of this is Assuming that they're imposed means they're artificial uh, and instead of count, accounting for the fact that this is a really fluid period, that 1918 isn't really the end of a war uh, time, a war time that extends across the, the region during this, the, the moment extending into the 1920s. And it also ignores the fact that the Middle East, as everywhere else, is a place where political boundaries, political spaces, and political institutions are produced over time, and violence is really important in that process. Another final kind of critique, I think maybe I have one more, is that that narrative of 1915, 1916, 1917, 1920, 1923 assumes that at that moment in the middle of a war, both the colonial actors and the local actors had fixed preferences and then acted upon them afterwards and either those were fulfilled or those were denied um, and it, it again ignores the reality of dynamism that happens over time and then the last piece is definitely really key to the argument in the book is that that sykes picot narrative has a terrible selection bias meaning it's a myopic narrative focused on just part of the map which is the parts that became mandates in greater syria and mesopotamia it ignores what happens in iran anatolia arabia and all of north africa what's the alternative and i'll skim through this a bit effectively what i'm doing in the book is to say what if we think about all of world war one from the perspective of the middle east two things that happen when you do that that the book lays out is that the periodization needs to change both the start date and the end date um the start date 1914 is not the beginning the onset of wartime in the middle east the onset of wartime is 1911 in the spring of 1911 the french and the spanish uh in occupy inland morocco and provoke a crisis that almost leads to war because of the uh, franco-german tensions and then in the in september the Italians invade Ottoman North Africa in Tripoli and Benghazi, and the Ottomans are on a wartime footing, more or less, with a couple of months of break uh, up through from that point forward. And then it it, it changes obviously in in, uh, in 1914 into an inter in empire war time. The end of the war is also is even less less clear. 1918 does not work uh, because on the ground as the map showed before, there's actual warfare that's happening well into the 1920s and I argue up to 1934 which is when from Morocco to Arabia you kind of have a settling of what the post-war um, map will look like the other thing that's important is to stretch out the geography so a wide uh frame that as as I've said over and over already doesn't just focus on the eastern Mediterranean but it ex expands out to include the Atlantic coast to the Iranian plateau and here uh, and this is related to, I think, uh, those of us that are interested in the Middle East. I think this is a, a way to think about the Middle East as an interacting system on the, that has a kind of Rodelian sense of water and littorals and, and uh, land topography of mountains, et cetera, and interconnections between the, Med the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the, the Indian Ocean. So in that, this, this is kind of the major points of the book is to say that it's war that makes the modern Middle East, not a peace settlement and secret agreements. Um, war unmakes the Alawite, Ottoman, and Qajar states. It also makes new states within that. And um, 
In addition, and I'm making an argument kind of about these big global wars, uh, including World War One and World War Two, and there's some 19th century ones that are important too. The other thing is that we, when in terms of thinking of the nation, thinking of these like political identities, it's a it's it's a call to consider how war transforms how we think of imagined political communities. And then finally, and this is kind of the end of the list, which may have be something that people think should be the beginning of the list, but in my mind, I realized over time that working on this is that the borders are a late, uh, they're a derivative effect of these other two processes. And it's war that makes the borders not peace. Uh, and the borders don't cause war, they're actually the result of war. And then to kind of move into quickly, uh, just a quick overview of the different sections here. Um, part one is looking at the unmaking of the political order of the region. And here we're looking at the longer 19th century, the pressures from the East with the great game, Rus Russian and British tensions, the Eastern question with the Ottoman Empire's position within European diplomatic and, and imperial expansive competition. And then there's a Moroccan question in the West. Uh, there's a, it's kind of very similar as like the strategic importance of the Straits of Gibraltar and who who's gonna control the Southern shore of that. These build up and then in, through the, 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 what I mentioned before, the Ottoman crisis, sorry, the Moroccan crisis and then the Talo Ottoman War builds through into Europe wide war in 1914. And then the next chapter looks at the Ottomans' war. In this period of inter empire war, the Ottomans face uh, five fronts of, uh, in terms of theaters of how they're trying to conduct the war, being pressured by the British, by the Russians. Um, and tr from multiple directions in trying to maintain and defend their autonomy. Part two looks into this middle period from 1918 into the early 1920s where both the colonial powers and the local powers are thinking of new futures here. And this happens at the Paris Peace Conference and it happens on the ground. Um, and in the, you know, after the Treaty of Sev, what is actually emerging in the region, which isn't exactly connected to the treaty terms, uh, is actual colonial and local viable projects. These narrow down, and the last part, this is the kind of a, a listing of those. I can bring this up later if we need to look back at it. Um, but these narrow down, and the, the final part of the story is the late 1920s, mid to late 1920s, early 1930s, in which you've got large-scale conventional warfare continuing in hot spots that range from the reef area of northern uh, northwest africa the kurdish areas across the taurus and zagros mountains uh and in syria and then the next uh wave of this is in game struggles uh, continuing in kurdistan and then also including uh, libya and the arabian peninsula so i'm going to wrap up here it's basically to say that the modern, making the modern Middle East is a process, it's not an event. And this is really what the book is, is spending a lot of time convincing you of. In the, in the fact that the, the new political order of the region is not produced again through agreements during, uh, or peace treaties, it's actually violent interactions on the ground. And that we have to take that period as its own thing. It's not, there's not just kind of late Ottoman or late Khazar or whatever. There's actually, a, and then instantly switch to mandate history it actually needs to be uh its own time period of a couple of decades and in the kind of implications of that which as as ron and i get talking i think this might come through is is what does it mean that if there's not an original sin of these this uh the, the way we understood it as a sykes bigo kind of inner uh original sin then then what are the alternatives here um and i think that's that's a way that i'm going to wrap up this and be able to open this up and, and Ron, I can have a conversation and looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So let me unshare. If I can, maybe <laughs> I'm struggling to get out of it. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation and just uh, I've been reading your book over the past few days. And I have to say, I'm really impressed by the uh, range of of detail that that you provide the uh, you know the the regional richness and uh, clearly you've done like a lot of uh, research to produce that much detail and so much evidence also for uh, the argument that you make. Um, I mean, two things I I, I really uh, appreciated about your argument. First, uh, the new per periodization of the First World War. I think that's uh, a really important step to like thinking about. Uh, 
um, the origins of the war, how, how it started, but also kind of uh, to provide a, a, a story that's that takes us away from the Eurocentric approach to uh, the history of the 20th century, you know, usually beginning with um, uh, the allied and central powers and, you know, to the exclusion of um, people in the Middle East and uh, their preferences, uh, their struggles and so on. Uh, the second thing is is uh, I found I found really important is uh, that you start with the story of the Ottoman Empire, the Qajar, uh, and 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 that is really important for thinking about the implications of the 19th century uh, to the 20th and even the present, and how uh, that world of the 19th and uh, between the 16th and 19th century was unmade. Um, through different political processes, and you highlight what those uh, you, you you explain what those processes uh, were and how the transformation uh, came about. Um, I have a few questions, but um, to start, I I think I want to ask you about uh, the regional scope uh, of of your book and uh, why you chose. Uh, this uh, sort of uh, analytic unit of the greater Middle East spanning uh, Morocco to Iran. I wonder if you can uh, talk about this a little bit. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rana. That, one of the background stories here that uh, is a, maybe to give you a sense of how I ended up doing the book the way it ended up coming out. I initially, uh, my work was focused on French colonialism in North Africa, and I was looking at the creation of a colonial state in Morocco and, and how that politicizes identity. And in that book, I had a chapter that was on the Reef War. And in working on the Reef War, I, and that project is just in the context of this Moroccan story, but I realized that that moment, I think it was one of the times it started to, uh, highlight for me the the density of the connections that extend from the Maghreb or North Africa to the Mashriq or the Middle East uh, that often these two even you know in terms of disciplinary specialization etc they get they get separated and this is uh, a moment at which in the 1920s I started to see the reef wars really connected to the Syrian revolt uh, they're both French um, colonial holdings and there's uh, both because the French are moving personnel back and forth including colonial soldiers back and forth uh, but there's also kind of tactically reading about, uh, you know, some of the work on Faisal Kalakji, uh, the one of the Syrian leaders that uh, is very consciously paying attention to what the French are doing and tactically um, deciding when to instigate uh, an uprising in Hama. And so there were things that kind of clued me in in the 1920s as see this sort of interconnected space that uh, that that last section there to see that you have synchronicities that so the Kurdish, the Reef, the Syrian are happening within the they're, they're overlapping in spring summer of 1920 and then 25 uh, and then similarly um, you know that on the ground I guess there's two sides of it on the ground in the colonial powers this is uh these are relationally connected and, and and to bifurcate them or to kind of separate them doesn't make sense. And I think over time that that worked itself into a bigger perspective of like, how do we think about a kind of regional history, which is nested in a bigger world historical moment of a world war? And, and how would you tell that by, but avoiding getting siloed into one part of the story? Uh, and my, my, eventually the goal came to be is how do you tell reg regional history? And that it, it made me keep pushing back earlier in time towards the late 19th century and then how you get into the war. And I think that was this kind of a, a bit of a Maghrebist uh, affirmative action kind of bias. But I was like, wait a minute, the war starts in North Africa and it's actually really connected. And the Italians are um, attacking in Tripoli and then they're attacking in the Red Sea at Kunfuda against an Ottoman Navy and they're off the Arabian coast. And then they're bombing Beirut, and then they're taking the, Dar the Dodecanese Islands, and then they're pushing. To so I think over and over, the way that the region worked together as a system became evident in the empirics I was looking at. And then to try to step back and think about writing it up uh, in a way that the reader can understand the breadth of that, but also feel how things are happening across that at the same time and how they might be related. 
Thank you. Um, I mean, your answer also pushes me to think about um, how uh, the region would be taught um, like in, in, acad in different academic disciplines. I mean, you know, we often have uh, departments focused on the Middle East and then, uh, you know, North Africa is sometimes studied in Middle Eastern studies, but also, you know, we have a lot of uh, North Africa scholars who are in African history, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I think it pushes us to really think and rethink really the uh, these regional boundaries, even as uh, as scholars. I mean, I, I you know, as, as now may uh, kindly introduce me, I, I, I graduated from a Middle East, South Asia, mm -hmm. Africa, but we didn't really have uh, a lot of like North Africa. I feel that they actually sometimes in French history departments, right? And mm -hmm. uh, study like in focus in, um, French, uh, French philosophy, French history, and so on. Um, so I want to uh, really get to the uh, main arguments, central arguments of 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 the book, and um, I think I'm gonna uh, maybe push you a little bit to clarify some of uh, the arguments that you make. Um, so uh, a central argument, as you uh, outline in the book and just now in the presentation. Is, uh, is that you criticize the original uh, sin story of the Sykes-Picot agreement, and uh, you highlight the important interactions between uh, what you term local and, and colonial uh, actors in the Middle East, uh, greater, the, greater, the greater Middle East, as, as you call it. Uh, you also uh, draw attention to the uh, gap between the treaties themselves, the terms of the treaties and facts and realities on the grounds and the conflicts that actually emerged and uh, were sustained long after the treaties uh, had been signed. Um, so these are really crucial interventions, but um, while uh, you know, while uh, in the different chapters of the book, you do point out the uh, difference in the power dynamics, uh, between the different actors, whether local or colonial, um, one really, I feel like, gets the sense that um, at the end of the day, you're saying that uh, both local and colonial actors equally produced uh, political realities on the ground and equally shaped uh, the boundaries. So um, I want to ask you about the consequences of uh, foregoing the original uh, SIN account uh, it does seem to me, at least, that uh, the interactions you describe are themselves the product of uh, colonial uh, interference and violent occupation. So it might not, as you say, be uh, Sykes-Picot uh, that simply produced those boundaries, but uh, I still find it difficult to let go of the notion of, uh, of, of the notion of the original sin and that uh, there was colonialism and colonialism had serious consequences and actually shaped uh, the way people uh, interacted uh, to begin with. So I wonder what your thoughts are on, on this. No, I, that's a great point, Rana. I and I think that's really important to get into more. Uh, I didn't have enough time in the presentation, um, but it, it is a background question as I started to get into it. I, I, my quick answer would be, maybe a way to rephrase your question is is there any original sin maybe that's not the original sin but is there another one and i think that that i would lean in that direction i think you know i'm not exonerating colonial powers i'm not exonerating the british and the french i'm saying that what they did wrong was not imposing artificial boundaries on the region they didn't impose what it, that 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 statement in itself i reject the premises of one the imposition isn't real it's it's something that takes a really long time it gets it's not imposed it's it's worked out through time and violence. And the question of artificiality is also, and I think there's like a lot of implications in the region. The question, if you think borders are artificial, it means you there's a counter, there's a, the other flip side of that is there are authentic and real boundaries. And that's, I reject the premises of that. In the Middle East, in North America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, all boundaries, all political boundaries are historically produced through process and time and the notion right if you feel like what would the boundaries be around you're assuming some idea of a kind of normative understanding of what a, a demos or like a people are that the polity should naturally be and my argument is that and this follows all of that kind of moment wilsonian style ethno national uh self-determinations premise on these ideas that those things really exist and i reject the premises of those those are not naturally existing communities that that have a political 
a natural and obvious political expression to them. Um, and then, you know, that is, there's an original sin in the ways that those discourses, uh, in the ways that we think of the normative order of a uh, normative political order should look, uh, it's, there's also an exceptionality that it, it's, um, we take out the kind of, I mean, the original sin, you know, back to that question, is that the colonial powers interrupted or in, in several cases, you know, violently suppressed any naturally kind of growing organic formed mechanisms and, and institutional infrastructures of representation in terms of figuring out how to govern uh, a group together, uh, most egregiously in the case of kind of great, greater Syria. And so in that sense, there is an original sin that they they uh, squash those and then impose colonial states, which are by you know, more or less by definition, a kind of authoritarian security apparatus. And that's the inheritance that kind of moves forward. The other thing I want to say, I, I just real quickly, is that the counterfactual, so this question of um, the other thing I think that you have to step back and if you actually look at, at the cases, again, if you pull the, the lens out off of the mandates, Turkey, what is Turkey? Turkey imposes reality on anybody, on, on the colonial powers as much as, as anybody gets imposed on in the region. And honestly, the other case that I was surprised, I didn't really think of it that way, but Saudi Arabia imposes its reality on the Arabian Peninsula and the British are doing a rear guard action, just trying to keep them under control. And eventually they're being, this is kind of at the end of the book, this is a moment at which this, there's an internal struggle between Ibn Saud and Ikhwan, a civil war that he wins out with some British assistance. And then there's also, because he's he's kind of gotten to the point where he's accepting an interstate paradigm of political order in the region. And he, there's a, the, you know, a peace agreement with Yemen in 1934, where it's more or less settled by that point. So those are a few thoughts That's not, that we could talk, and I don't want to talk the rest of the day, but I, you're right. That's a really important questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I keep thinking about also, um, you know, the second uh, aspect of your argument is the question of political imagination. So it's not just, you know, there are realities uh, that uh, are, are shaped on the ground, but also uh, people imagine different realities upon which they act. And you provide many, many examples of uh, projects that uh, seemed viable in the moment, but were then uh, really uh, crushed uh, later, or even um, simply just uh, you know just put aside for a different different political projects. Um, and I think I want to um, take up this uh, question. And uh, you know, you give the example of of uh, Greater Syria, for example. And uh, you know, there's this really interesting part where you talk about how Palestinians imagined uh, their future after the Ottoman Empire, and you know, people imagined that uh, maybe they might be uh, become you know be affiliated with Egypt, become a, a region uh, in a kind of a in Greater Egypt or something like that. Some people pushed for. Uh, you know, a, a unified uh, greater Syria. And then uh, there were the colonial powers that uh, wanted to uh, divide uh, the area between the French mandate, British mandate, uh, and so forth. So I want to uh, take up this question again of, of the uh, different uh, futures and how they were imagined. Um, and again, uh, it seems to me that even on the level of the imagination, it, the imagine the political imagination itself is circumscribed by uh, the uh, political and, and colonial context, right? And so um, it's related to my previous question, but uh, that is to say that one still does get the impression that um, political imaginations, you know, are um, are just kind of roam like wild sometimes. And I, I think that does happen in, in certain moments. Um, but I think, you know, to what extent do you think that uh, realities on the ground uh, cons conscript and, and uh, circumscribe uh, the political imagination? Yeah, and that's definitely a huge point that I, I'm trying to emphasize uh, that uh, one line, which is that there's a bias in the Sykes-Picot narrative, which is that people just had fixed preferences. They wanted this after the war and they got it or they didn't get it. And I think it's really important if you actually historicize what people actually think, it changes over time. There are, you know, people have dreams and they have kind of top priorities. There's a rank choice kind of thing. The, the King Crane Commission reports um, for whatever their limitations are, et cetera, but they are a record of 
to some extent the only record we have a public opinion in this in in kind of the greater Syria up into so, southern uh, Anatolia. Um, and you see in that, I mean, you just, anybody, a lot of us have spent time and uh, use those maybe in class, et cetera. And you can just see that there's a lot of futures that are thinkable there. And there's all, but there, and there's also preferences amongst those. And there's ways that, you know, this is a snapshot moment, but over months uh, into 1920, those uh, futures become for some more and less thinkable, um, right? Because of facts on the ground. And this is, it's not Paris Peace Conference or San Remo Conference exactly immediately translating into that. Um, but you do have, you know, Gouro, the French army is coming across the Maysaloon Pass and putting down this imagined Arab kingdom that is not going to be viable the rest of the 1920s in a form that would encompass southern Syria. There's another push in the mid 1920s to flip the mandate and actually create some kind of an independent entity there. Uh, but there's, you know, the, the French and the Italians have an imagined future of some kind of a colonial influence in southwest Anatolia. It doesn't, it doesn't last very long. The Greeks have a greater Greece that they push it on the ground to achieve, and then it's not thinkable. So I think this is just a, that has to be tracked. I think you're, but you're pushing out, like, there's a deeper kind of a normative thing about, again, does does a frustration of some kind of political expression of autonomy, et cetera, uh, there is, I don't, I'm not saying there's not something wrong with squashing that. I'm not relativizing all of this, but I do want to, I do, because I, I think it, it, it's important if it's, if you actually historicize this, then it, and this is kind of the last slide, which I slipped off is if the future wasn't fixed then, that there was contingency. And also this is not imposed upon people. It's process, it's violence, et cetera. And there are a lot of outcomes in that that moment, but it means that the present is also political. The present is not we're not, this is not we're in a faded, fallen state, right? Of damnation or something, right? It's it's future is thinkable right now. The present is thinkable, and the future is rethinkable. And I think it's really important to decouple those things. I mean, to, to decouple the fact like there's not some like it was is a one and done, and the Palestinians or what some other group do or don't get what they want. Uh, I mean, this is a lot, you know, these are the big questions, but I think there is a piece of this. If you look back at that moment, it makes the present thinkable. And the problem with, I mean, to take that case, the problem with Palestine, the tensions in Palestine don't really have to do with borders. I mean, in the sense of the shape of Palestine, we could talk about Israel's partitioning of, of, of space within that. Um, and I'm saying borders aren't important, but like, it's a political question inside of whatever the borders ended up being. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, when I asked the question, I did um, have Palestine in mind. So I'm glad you uh, you bring this up. Um, just just to like kind of uh, touch on that a little bit. Um, the way I I see it, for example, and I, I wonder, uh, you know, what what you think of that, uh, what you can make out of it. Um, it, it seems to me that. Um, boundaries the way i would understand is that boundaries are imposed uh they are in question they're like part of the question they're not uh the only question but it seems to me that the imposition actually determines the interactions that you describe in the book so there is the live uh, at least on some level uh there is an imposition of certain realities and then uh, what people imagine and the interactions that people have on the ground are actually uh, circumscribed and constricted even uh, by uh, by that imposition. Um, so, for example, you know, with with the Palestine example that you touch on in the book and and just now, uh, where you know, since 1948, for example, we have increasing levels of Israeli settler colonialism. Uh, in the 1948 territories, but also uh, more so uh, now, at least increasingly in the West Bank. So these boundaries have shifted, right? In Palestine, like if we look at, at the map in 1947, in, the, in 1947, and look at it now, I mean, their maps have been repeatedly pr pr been produced of how um, borders have been shaped and reshaped and, reshaped and redrawn. Uh, repeatedly, and so the map itself uh, looks different, and that actually, uh, to me at least, shapes the way people interact and, and react to the imposition of those boundaries. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you know, there are uh, areas where like settlements like pop up, and then you know there are Palestinians who like 
go and like you know uh, and they uh, carry out and and uh, these sit-ins and protests um, precisely in order to to demarcate like boundaries right and make claims to to the boundaries themselves. So that actually gives uh, credence to your point where you say that uh, you know boundaries are made and remade right. They are not they're produced. They are not just simply there right. Uh, so they're neither natural nor artificial. But again. Um, I do think that uh, that there is at least on one level an imposition of certain realities to which people uh, react uh, subsequently. Yeah, that's a great. I think that's a good point of clarification. Is I'm not saying that boundaries are never forged. I think the word imposition in implies a kind of unilateral, external, and also kind of instantaneous thing. And I'm saying it's actually interactive, relational, violent over time. So Israel changes boundaries through multiple wars over the past 70 years. Um, and that I think the so so one is let me bracket off Palestine, that'd be this one case, and we'll come I'm gonna come back to it. But just to point out, this is also what I'm saying is like, if you have to open up things, so even if Palestine is falling through these things, and then be important to note those, they're exceptional, I think, in compared to the rest of the region. You've got parts of the region that their political entities that end up after that are bigger than people think they should have been. Sometimes they're smaller. Like the, there's not a consistency of like, oh, boundary drawing is wrong or right in any 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 direction. And I think it kind of falls apart once you, um, you know, is there any integrity? Should Morocco have the boundaries it has right now? It's a historical process, and there was contingency. There remains contingency and contestation of what the boundaries are in terms of Western Sahara. So I think this is, you know, just like de because you know, Palestine can suck ev all the attention, and also it's not the it's not the uh, exemplary case. It's a con it, it is an important case, but it doesn't tell us the story of the region. I think that's one thing. Bracket that off. Middle the, the the region actually has such a so many different things happening there. But then the quick thing on on Palestine, I think is just to note uh, that both the kind of different visions of the future for that unit, that the British are you know, on the map, if they're gonna be more unilateral than not, this is a place where they're probably the most unilateral. They just decide the East Bank is gonna be something, the West Bank's gonna, Palestine's gonna be something. They negotiate with the French for a bit on the Northern boundary, and it doesn't really matter that much on the Southern boundary because Egypt's also a, a British protectorate. But within that, I just want to point out, and as we kind of open it up to the Q&A from other people, uh, that both the Palestinians, uh, Arabs and Palestinian Jews and those, you know, all the, the different actors there have pretty expansive and, and, and uh, uh, flexible notions of the space of what in which what they want to happen can happen. So there's debates over, you know, OK, lose the East Bank. OK, we don't get to go up to the Latani River. OK. Etc. Right, it, but you can still have that project within a smaller or larger space. The imagination can happen with that, and it's. It, I just that's my last point. Is like it is adaptable. This is. I, I'm. I actually don't even want to um, go to anybody else's questions. I want to keep hearing you guys debate this. And um, before I kind of go to the questions, I do want to say I really appreciated the points that both of you brought out in this conversation. Um, particularly about the difficulty of kind of dislodging this, this both periodization, but also narrative arc with which we all teach um, the modern Middle East. And um, I don't have any more answers, but I definitely have more mm -hmm. questions than I did um, when I first started. So I really want to appreciate it. I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of, we have a lot of questions and I want to pick up the question that kind of allows you to expand on some of the strands that already in your conversation with Lana um, had had sort of illuminated. And that's the question about your emphasis on war and process instead of peace treaties as ultimately shaping realities on the ground. So this question comes from John Everett and he says, um, how do you view the connection between war-driven or wartime socialization and ethno-nationalism? So it sounded like you use war as, in, as a sociological analytic to propose a way of thinking beyond ethnic frames as the core of nation states. So do wartime logics of opposition slash hostility or loyalty slash alliance revise ethno-national imaginaries or reinforce them? So kind of intersecting with already what you guys yeah. had started talking about. Right, that's a great question. And it really gets uh, the 
yeah, meat stuff going on in the book or what should be <laughs> the meat stuff. Um, cause I do think that's really, I, I, I'm definitely emphasizing that, uh, the experience of war in, in this great literature, this is uh, something that is, is just this past 15, 20 years of, of a filling out of a wonderful literature on wartime, World War One, um, and, and even a lot of great, uh, I mean, there's a lot of great social history of that too. I do think something that's, I don't, I don't want to like absolutely categorize one thing or another I, this question of ethnic eth, like forms of political identification i think war is transformative because it's uh it shakes up uh, back to this idea of of futures that be, can be thinkable or not thinkable there's points at which i mean the war is crushing certain modes of political identification that they hadn't been static they they had been dynamic but from iran to the ottoman sphere to across north africa there are ways of being as a political kind of uh, the, the ways that those parts of one's identity were thinkable and just uh, there were practices or just like a, a normalization of that that's all disrupted and it's not just the middle east is being disrupted and obviously it's a global war that's transforming these things so i think accounting for that is really important and again it's 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 a, a exceptional kind of world historical time like the patterning of kind of more stasis is again on, on more on the spectrum than a, a hard typology from stasis to something really dynamic and unsettled and and uh you know there, that there's there's a lot of uh, that dynamism that's happening. This is that side of the spectrum because of the kind of period that it's in, and in that accounting for in that chapter where we talk about the many fronts of the Ottomans' war. This is really important in the uh, intensity of that uh, kind of a cauldron of, of, of violence, et cetera, from the Eastern Front and the Caucasus across. Uh, what's happening in, in back and forth between the Ottoman army and the Russian army, the Armenian, Assyrian, and Kurdish populations that are on the ground at the, in that space. What's happening on the Mesopotamian front as a British Indian army is occupying from Basra north to Mosul. The experience on the, any one of them, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them, even the home front in Istanbul is being transformed. So I think that experience of wartime is just a massive kind of uh, turboed change and social change is happening because war is just, it, 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 you think about tech, technological leaps that happen during warfare, you're going to go with the social implications too. So I think that's really important what, what you are, are mentioning there. I don't think, this is also maybe the, the point to say that you can't just stop the, the, in, the, the, the that war doesn't stop on a dime in Oct October 28th when the Ottoman representative signs an armistice. And so that capturing that continuing dimensions of wartime and how it has social implications is really important because it is changing what people can think about. And it's also, it's not an either or like you switch from an imperial Ottoman identity to a national identity or something like that. It's actually all kinds of ups and above those levels, below those levels in, in, in a pragmatic utilitarian ways of mobilizing picking from here and there you think about a lot of people that I'm, I'm talking about use all different idioms uh to try to get collective identity uh, mobilized into uh physical kind of violent or or just institutional apparatuses religious ethnic lingu ethno linguistic historical regional there's a lot of things happening in the moment and that's in the messiness of that is what i think is important that we recognize Yes, I mean, I'm going to pick up the next question that, you know, as Rana mentioned, your work is very rich in terms of also just the empirical detail um, of what you're talking about. And you mentioned in terms of the messiness. So um, Taha Kelim uh, asks um, about the interplay that you talked about, the interplay between political imagination and he says the unmaking of the modern Middle East. And so he wants, his question is, uh, he's wondering about the political aspirations of people living within and outside the region at that time. How do you think these aspirations shape the modern Middle East? And maybe you can um, you use this to actually talk about some of the more um, detailed and, and you know, just give a sense of, of what these aspirations were about with one or two examples. Yeah. I mean, one that's interesting that, that I guess I, I, I learned so much, it was uh, 
I, I uh, am grateful. There's a ton of work that other people have done that make it possible to step back and think about how you would weave the, that stuff together. And one of the things I learned a lot about was um, early, the early history of the Turkish Republic would be maybe one, one place to think about this and the ways that you really have in 19, you know, in winter of 1918, 19, 19, 19, 1920, the reworking and recalculations of trying to resurrect a core independent autonomous something post Ottoman thing. And, and it really it's a Turco Kurdish political project, like the military mobilization that's happening. Uh, Mustafa Kemal goes to Eastern Anatolia to get this thing going. And he forges a kind of imagined future Turco-Kurdish polity that involves both of those identities and, and that those are very uh, d complicated, but there's also a religious dimension. And then over time it changes. And I think the, the Kurdish groups, the dissatisfaction with the direction of the Turkish Republic after the, the war for independence and the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne, and then those internal tensions that you get in Anatolia over that imaginary. I mean, that's something that, right, this is among the list of things that remain unresolved. Uh, and this kind of, these tension points, obviously the Kurdish question is still in place. Um, it's impinging on Turkish reality, it's now impinging on Iranian reality, obviously in our Iraq and Syria. So yeah, I guess I'll stop there. There's a lot, that's a great, you know, there's a lot in, of keep going, I think. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a turn. Uh, we've had two questions, which in different ways are asking about um, sociology, history, methodologies, um, and how that impacts the kind of framework um, mm. that your book is presenting and suggesting. Uh, so I'm just gonna combine these questions which are from Gabriel Young and our own, or ex own Daniel Neep. Um, so the question that I'm gonna to put together is, one is that what are the most important methodological gains that historians of the modern Middle East can take from historical sociologists such as yourself? But so Daniel kind of asks you to so the first question is basically, what can historians learn from historical sociologists? But also he asked you to talk about how you navigate the tension between the historical sociologist's desire to theorize through large scale macro historical processes and the historian's insistence on patience. And that's Daniel's word. I would never use the word patient for myself, but let's, let's just accept that. The historian's insistence, insistence on patient meticulous readings of primary sources that often relate to the small scale. So is, how can historians learn from historical sociologists? What can they learn about the region, but also what's the tension? Can you talk about the grand scale theorizing versus the small scale um, meticulous readings of texts? Yeah, okay. So, um, right true confessions or, or whatever, but my own training was as a historian. And then I got hired into a sociology department and had to figure out how that worked so I could keep working there and get tenure. Um, but so I think at the end of the day, I, I kind of just walk this line of a historical sociologist slash sociological historian and that the tension between exactly uh, Daniel and I have had conversations a bit about this before, but like that tension between those two poles, right? And in how to um right the cost on the one side of being too macro and too emphasize i guess uh the analytical precision or which is it's a strength and a weakness uh and and, and how do you marry that to the other side in historical uh the just the by either through text or through whatever kind of sources that close reading that gives a sense of of a reality that is not visible. I think, again, kind of where you are thinking about these things. I had to, I had a war going on in my mind, which is kind of feeling guilty because this is a big project that is primarily, I do have primary sources, you know, I went to a lot of archives, um, a lot of the local, just as a lot of the local archives over the period that I was writing it became, went offline. So I was wanting to go to Tripoli, there's a big, Gaddafi organized a big oral history project that got uh, oral 
testimonies um, from people that participated in the Senussi, the various Italo-Ottoman war, not Italo, um, Senussi war really, um, and that I couldn't go, or I didn't go <laughs> to Tripoli. Uh, after 2011, it became unfeasible. So there's a lot of things I wished I could have gotten in Syria and Libya, and even to go to, uh, I ended up going to Iraqi Kurdistan and not to um, Southeast Turkey. But I did do a lot of archival work, but it was also really relying upon a secondary synthesis. And so I think this is where these two things to come together is that the cost on the historians, this idea of kind of the time and scale at which what you can work with, I mean, I'm trying to think of ways to say this without being <laughs> incentive in any direction, but that it does require time and focus on a part of the picture to get a sense, you couldn't think of the big, the breadth of the picture unless you know each part of that. But then the cost of looking at the one part of the picture is that you like, what's the container that you're deciding? I'm looking at X and there is a, there is a presuppositional choice that's being made. And for me, and the, I'm fumbling through getting into this, this idea of what I, I had to kind of think about the Middle East as a, what I mentioned before, as a regional system, but I'm not using it as, it's not a, a, a great power story. It's not a single case or even a two case empire comparison. This is the architecture of the book is it's seven empires probably that are involved. Um, the local ones, Ottoman, Qajar, Alawite, British, French, Spanish, Italian, Russian, German. I think that's it. Um, and so not not siloing into either any one of those stories, not siloing on the other side into just the Reef story or just the Sunusi story, just the Kurdish story, the Arabian story. How do you weave that together? And this is I'm back on this idea of the macro historical processes, the historian part of me, which is was resisting. And this is, I think, the architecture of what he's trying to put together is how do you tell a relational history over time of a large system that doesn't lose sight of those really fascinating and important intimate interactions amongst all of those moving pieces that have a, a locus, like there's a physical site that's important in that. And that's what I'm trying to also give the reader the sense of how that happens, recreate or recapture that. But with the analytical kind of payoff to say this, you know, if you're an IR person, you can't understand outcomes by just emphasizing these variables on the top side, that, that international actors, imp back to the idea of imposing realities here. And it's not just a subaltern um, history from below story. It's something in the interface of those things uh, that you have to see over and over again across this breadth of the region. And then that does generate the larger emergence of something. All right, that's one swipe at that, at that question. Rana, do you want to take a swipe as someone who's read the book very carefully, but also I think in some ways, you know, you, you come from a department that's not history necessarily, but which doesn't matter. But um, just thinking about Jonathan's book and because I felt like your questions were also at, below your questions was also this question of the tension between the large scale and the small scale when thinking about something as big as World War I and world uh, and world making, which is in your title, um, Jonathan. So uh, Ram, do you want, do you have any thoughts on this question? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, just initial thoughts. I mean, in, I mean, the way I, I in my own research, the, the sort of the, in order to think about those small scale processes, um, the approach I, I use in my own work is uh, actually the history, the, the concepts and methods of the history of science and technology. And so I focus on you know small scale um, processes that uh, are not, I do not directly address war. So it's not like a, uh, it's, I don't like do necessarily like political uh, theory, but. Um, but yeah, but I also like have this um, problem of the tension between um, focusing on small scale processes, but also making a larger argument that has um, broader implications. And I think I uh, that is a difficulty because um, you know one is at, at the end of the day, you know, can, one can really get bogged down by all the details, and then it becomes hard to kind of make a a larger argument. Um, and then also thinking about the uh, how applicable that argument beyond a particular uh, the particular area that one studies, um, even you know, even like sometimes you know, I work in Egypt, but it's you know, I I wonder if uh, 
my work simply or the the results and findings of my work simply apply to uh, different areas, which is why I, I really liked um, that you, Jonathan, in your book, you really focus on the particularities of, of all, of every region. I mean, you have uh, sections on every separate region and you discuss it separately, but then at the end of the day, I think you do a really good job with that and uh, focusing on, you know, giving details, but also uh, making sure that you're still uh, working on the specificity of each and not dismissing that. Um, so I mean, yeah, I it's it's hard for me to be honest to like answer that question, but it's uh, I do face face it as a uh, a major difficulty. The other thing I really wanted to comment on a question of uh, the question of war because I was thinking um, while reading your book about uh, Foucault's society uh, must be defended um, because he does provide a certain theory of war and how it continues uh, underneath in times of peace and actually produces. Uh, society, right? Um, and so I think uh, I think someone asked a question about that. I saw in the in the Q and A, and uh, yeah, I mean, I I reading and thinking about war as an analytic uh, question, I I always find uh, society <laughs> must be defended really uh, useful. So okay, well, thankfully we have Jonathan to keep. <laughs> going digging deeper and deeper into these questions. Um, but going back to uh, the questions from the audience, um, Alat Murad, who's also one of our graduate students, um, is asking you a question again about local actors, but in a, in a different way, uh, which is talking about, she says, in the moment, say 1911, at the start of the war in the Maghreb, um, do local actors have the worldview forwarded by your argument? as not necessarily shaped by singular colonial or local events, but by actually a long process. So how do local actors discuss the transformations they're experiencing as they are actually happening? And she says, thank you. A lot of people had yeah. said thank you for a great talk. So no, I, love that. I love that. That's a really great point. I, I Just to kind of step back into more general terms, uh, right, history, for sure, I think any kind of historical analysis um, is always we're parsing continuity and change. Um, and that your question is really asking on that line is, are there are there deeper, longer continuity? This is part of it is like coming into this. How are people thinking? Uh, and because I think that um, part of the argument here is, uh, you know, it's not a juncture. But this is a critical juncture, long juncture of, of time with rapid transformative change that's happening but that's not the way that all time works right and i think you one can debate that and so the, the people themselves on the ground as they're thinking of what's happening the example i'm, I'm John, you're asking about 1911 in the maghreb um i don't nothing's coming to my mind immediately i, I although i mean i could talk out of the moroccan case so in, in that morocco has been under economic pressures and then under direct military pressures through the 19th century and then on the ground, um, French occupation forces in the coast, Atlantic coast in 1907 and from in Ujda in, in the east uh, from Algeria. And so people are, you know, tribal groups, etc. are, there's a civil war in Morocco, which is an internal tension and in, in, in conflict over uh, these perceptions of what's happening. Um, there's dissatisfaction with the Sultan in terms of not defending the country and there's a revolution a civil war between two rival claims to the throne so there's a lot that's happening and i think that it is you know these pressures are having an effect there um and i think you know the the, the one that rana brought up one of the examples so just palestine you know the it's uh salim tamari's great work on on uh memoirs uh and journals of different actors in the war and isan turjman the, this just Palestinian guy that's caught up in the war in Jerusalem and they're like thinking about what's going on. That's that, that thing. And they're like sitting around talking like, what's going to happen? Well, we're probably going to go with Egypt. The British are going to end up taking this. And there's just like, since I think it is important to kind of capture that. Uh, yeah, it, it does take it down. Like your, your question is saying, well, what about an individual person, an individual actor? And just like people are, are really thinking about these things. You know, what is it to be like to be you know, living in somewhere in, in Serenaka and in, in, um, Jabal uh, Akhdar and in uh, 1927 or something. I mean, these are actually real people that that ended. You know, in that case, this is violence of uh, the Italians moving 80,000 or, or you know, or maybe over 100,000 uh, just civilians onto the coast into concentration camps, and you have 80,000 that die in the midst of that. Ali Ahmed has worked on this genocide that's that goes on there. So this is like real. I mean, this isn't just 
whatever analytical historical sociology or something this is right this is a violent the war side is also thinking about what about genocide you know massive demographic transformations through violence that's happening through this period in the region which is huge um great um because today we really really have to end exactly on time i think um perhaps we have question for what time for one last question and then maybe if there's any last words um, that you and Rana wanted to give. Uh, the question comes from um, our, my colleague here, Amy Singer. She thanks you very much for this dynamic discussion, which I think we all do. But the question she's asking you is about chronology. The question is, you expanded the chronology backward to 1911, yet even continuing with your idea that war is the driving engine, one could easily extend the chronology actually even further into the 19th century. And I think that question actually already has come up about pushing it back and Rana mentioned it as one of the contributions. Um, so she's saying, but pushing it into the 19th century to the Greek war of independence, which is in a way catalyzes the nationalist imagination to conceive of ethno-nationalist independence as attainable through violent action. The idea, then gets infusions of internal and external energies from the 1820s through the 1920s and beyond. So isn't the focus on World War I, therefore, another way of artificially excluding key aspects of the formation of the 20th century MENA region? In other words, if you're gonna rethink the whole thing, doesn't it logically from your argument come that World War One should also be dislodged? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I wrestled with this back in kind of thinking about how the sausage is made type of a deal. Like, okay, how, when you're thinking about reperiodization, right? And this is also like how we make money as historians, right? This is like our game is <laughs> like thinking of not that much money, but like just periodization questions, right? It's like what you're, it's the, a lot of the work is thinking through, well, what is important about a period and how would I set that up? And um, and that's definitely, if you look at that first chapter, which is kind of the road to war, uh, you know, quite European, uh, sorry, qu question scrambles, et cetera, that I go back and, you know, kind of argue that, you know, I, mean, I go back to the 1500s with Ottoman expansion into the Mediterranean and into the Middle East uh, and up, you know, this is the Ukraine uh, and the, Bal the Black Sea kind of tensions and the interfaces of those empires. So it, it is a, definitely a question of, well, where do you draw the line? Like this could be a long, great war on the front end and it could go, is it over in 2022? And there's a lot of continuities that are going on here. But my, my answer is that the 1911 is uh, the, the end of the of a, a lot of stuff that's been happening and it's the beginning of the last chapter of that a lot of stuff that at least extends back to 1820 for sure um dynamics that are happening this is the crisis moment where you're in the you're in the it's like the it's the you know the chessboard it's it's the checkmate moment of like what's going to happen in those last moves uh, and that's really where i'm uh, i'm i'm periodizing the a long a great war that extends from 1911 to 1934 is the 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 ottomans okay the ottomans start facing this at you know maybe earliest with the greeks but this is their last stab at trying to deal with it and then in 1918 you don't have and you know the ottomans are done they're the in the Qajars are not going to last in that much longer and the alawites aren't going to last except that they do get reinvented by the french protectorate so that's really my answer to that and i think this is similarly on the other end of it it's like when would it end um i think my the way that i decided to make the my kind of analytical mechanism there to say this is where where it's done again it's not a hard date and one i'm open to be debating about it but in 1934 the french finished their pacification their military conquest of the atlas and the saharan regions in, in the west italy is put down the Senussis and as unifies uh creates libya as a unified unifying uh Fizan, tripletania and and um Cernica. And the Saudi sign and the Yemeni uh, the, uh, Imam Yahya signs a, a peace agreement, and he's already uh, by that point Ibn Saud signed treaties with Faisal in, in Iraq and with Abdullah in Jordan. And so the map is more settled than not. Turkey and Iran settle their border after the the Arab revolt. So things are going to keep happening. And Darussalam, there's another revolt, Palestinian Great Revolt. There's like I'm not saying that things aren't done, but from kind of Morocco to you know by this point the Pahlavi state by the 30s is kind of more there than not and it's not like it's not fluid and there's no dynamism at all but it is kind of moving into what it's going to remain 
uh, into the 20th century. So it's a really good question. And I, th I, I absolutely kind of agree with your, your point. And I'm just saying that the war is the last chapter of that story you're talking about on the front end, and that it's the beginning of the next chapter. And it's the, that has to be understood as an interlude. But it, the interlude itself has to be its own thing. Um, so I just want to use our last minutes actually to, there's, there's, a, there's more questions, but what, I, what I'm going to do, we're, we're going to give the transcript of the questions to Jonathan okay. and Toronto. Thank so you. if anybody wants to follow up with these, please feel free to do so. But I just wanted to give maybe a minute for concluding thoughts. I mean, not concluding, but, you know, semi-concluding, um, thoughts. And actually I'm going to ask Rana if she wants to just say anything and then give Jonathan the last word. I mean, I'm going to have the last word, Jonathan, but we'll, <laughs> we'll give you the last word. <laughs> Anna, is there anything you want to say to just wrap up this conversation? Not much to say, to be honest. I think I, I just uh, really enjoyed uh, Jonathan's book and, and the insights um, that he's made. And, you know, I, I feel that I, I too tend to think of um, the beginning of um, colonial borders, uh, beginning with like Sykes-Pico. And I think it's it's really important to like uh, rethink that narrative. And again, to look kind of below the surface of uh, agreements and, and look at uh, how people themselves like shaped uh, realities um, on the ground. I have a little more thinking to do about the specific arguments that I asked you about, Jonathan, mm -hmm. um, you know, regarding um, colonial borders, uh, questions of imposition, original sin. But um, I think you've, you've really given us, I think, all a lot to, to think about and to rethink, actually. And um, so I, I, I really thank you for that. Um, I just po popped in the last paragraph of the book. <laughs> this is kind of um, some of my final thoughts, and, 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 and one can, can read that. But I think at the end of the day, uh, I, well, one, I, I thank you so much for this opportunity and for all of you for coming out and just sharing this time together. I really appreciate that. Um, and I do hope that it, it, this is more the beginning of a conversation than the end of a conversation. The, the, the idea with the book was, OK, part of this is a, a kind of the destructive side is like, what if we dismantle the Sykes-Pico framework that we think about? And then I then I, people was like, but you can't just critique it. Like, what's your positive argument here? And so then trying to put up, okay, here's a big canvas. Here's what I think the picture looks like. But then to say to say, we need all we need everybody each other. And you can push back on on, on and argue what I'm talking about. But I do think size because wrong. Let's figure out what the what the alternative is and think of a way that we can also pass it on to our our students as we do teach, you know, courses on the region and and try to deal with how that connects to the present. So that last quote there, I'm not going to read it, but that's like my idea is like that there is the, the past isn't fate or something and that the present is also open in future, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was just really a fantastic conversation. Um, before we go, we have our last converse, our last seminar for the 2022, is that the year? Um, is going to be on December 7th with Brahim El Guabli. Um, Karen has dropped the link if you wanted to just get more information about that. And um, before we go, I want to thank again both Rana and Jonathan in particular for coming here. And as always, many thanks to Dr. Karen Spira for giving us logistical su support and making this all happen. And with that, um, thank you all and see you on December 7th.